tell me what a Siebel attack is and why mixed nets are vulnerable to Siebel attacks. So uh, Siebel attacks are a class of attack where you, 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 you utilize uh, numerous uh, uh, colluding nodes in the network to mount other types of attacks on the network. So it, it's, it's a class of attack that allows you to do more kinds of attacks by using collusion and multiple uh, nodes. Why do mixed nets uh, need to prevent uh, Siebel attacks? So, so uh, the reason why they want to prevent uh, Siebel attacks is so that one entity cannot uh, control the entire network or uh, de-anonymize users on the network. And you want to make it so that no one party can um, do that effectively. That you don't want it to, so that like the state of like, I don't know, uh, like or not, not the state of Kansas, but like, let's say a company in Kansas that, that you're trying to leak information from because they're doing bad stuff, you, want, you don't want it so that they can just spin up a thousand nodes and just destroy every, your anonymity. So. so how would having multiple nodes in the system destroy anonymity? When you own most of the network, there's, a, there's just a probabilistic chance that you're going to go over uh, enough nodes that are controlled by someone that they see all the hops and they own all the hops in, in, in the mixed net that you're using right now. So effectively, if they own all of the hops, it... Then you're, then you're done. Yeah, it, it's... They can see the entire route that you're taking. Yeah. So, so, and at that point, why even bother, right? In Tor, they have this concept of guards, yeah. exits, and so yeah, guards, middles, and exits. Like, right. can you explain uh, what uh, Siebel attackers can do if they own all of the exits, own all of the middles, or own all of the guards? Like, is there specific attacks that you can take out on either of those? Like, yeah. Those three so things? if you own all the exits, you see all the traffic that's going on with Tor and the internet. And you can collect a lot of metadata from that just in general, which is pretty dangerous, I'd argue, just alone from that. Um, then with guards, uh, if you own the guard, you can, you can enumerate uh, all of the users of Tor. Not necessarily what they're doing, but just all the users of Tor. Say you own all the guards, you can see everyone that uses Tor, but not what they're doing. Now, if you own some of the guards and some of the exits, you can tell what some of the people are doing some of the time. But like you, you can you can correlate uh, sometimes if you get lucky. Uh, if someone uses your guard, so it's a, your guard and your exit, then you can infer via the traffic shape, if you will, uh, which is you could say the traffic shape is. Uh, how much traffic you're using over time, right? Uh, you can infer just by looking at the edges uh, that this uh, client at this uh, guard and is using this exit for this time. You can correlate that. You don't need to look at what's in it, but you can tell just from the traffic shape itself that that is a correlation there. Um, and of course, if you're the exit, you can see exactly what's going through as well. Because uh, LAP is a layer three protocol, what advantages does that give it over something that was written on layer four, for example, Tor? Well, that would mean that uh, if, if you're using an anonymous layer three, that would effectively mean you can do everything that Tor can do, but more. Because not only can you do you know, TCP IP, you can do UDP IP, you can do ICMP over IP. You could do uh, you could do exotic tunneling protocols over IP. You could do like you know Ethernet over IP. You know whatever over IP. So with that, because you have a layer three, you have IP that's anonymized. You're, there's so much flexibility there. You can do anything. You can do almost, if not literally, anything you can do on the internet now anonymously over. And that's not the case with Tor? You no, I mean, well, it's a hack. If, if you want to do it, do IP over Tor, it's not that good. Because you're constrained to only TCP. So, I guess maybe the two more used internet protocols are TCP and UDP. Can you explain the difference between those two protocols? Sure. So, uh, TCP uh, is a protocol that 
uh, ensures that data is uh, delivered in order so that when you send, it's, it's like a stream. You want to make sure everything gets there in the order that you want it to. Um, and that requires you to uh, ensure that you have this three-way handshake and then you send uh, data back and forth between each other and you have retransmissions to make sure that things are sent in order and, you, and if things are dropped, they're resent. Um, so it ensures order between uh, two people on the network. UDP is just you send packets and hope they get there. So functionally, what does that mean for the user, for example? When so would you use UDP? And so when UDP would you is use mostly UDP? used with uh, protocols that can handle loss and, and, and with packet loss. Like DNS can handle a bit, uh, voice over IP applications, um, many, most, if not all, game protocols. And uh, stuff like video streaming? Uh, no, video streaming is mostly done over HTTP nowadays. And like, is that like YouTube is all done over HTTPS and HTTP, which is TCP based. Okay. What is a hidden service? So a hidden service is effectively, instead of accessing the internet, you're accessing someone else on the network anonymously, where both parties involved are anonymous. And you, it, it's, it's, it's the idea of hiding a server so that you don't know where the server is. Instead of knowing where the server is on the internet, it's somewhere on the network and you don't know where it is. So both sender and recipient are anonymous. And how is Loki going to do uh, hidden services? I2P uses what are called tunnels, and those are unidirectional uh, forwarding of packets from router to router. And you have an inbound, so you have, a, you have an outbound tunnel and you have an inbound tunnel. Right, you have outbound and inbound. And those are two separate distinct paths, right? And when you want to talk to another person's inbound tunnel, you have to, you send out of your uh, outbound tunnel and it goes to the inbound tunnel and it hops between tunnels. That hopping between tunnels is very annoying and it is where most of the packet loss in ITP happens. Um, but, what you, there's a trick that I, I figured out that you could do with ITP where you uh, would build an outbound tunnel that ends on the beginning of the other person's inbound tunnel. And with, with, with LARP, uh, that is required in order to uh, talk to another hidden service, is that you are required to align your uh, path with the other path for it to actually work at all. So does LARP use bidirectional? Or yeah, bi yeah. So tunnels? LARP does use bidirectional paths, or let's call them paths because they're bidirectional. Uh, so the the paths are bidirectional. When Alice wants to talk to Bob, where Bob is a hidden service, when you build that path that aligns with Bob's published uh, service, you are guaranteed to have a full duplex connection and path set up so that. Uh, both parties can immediately exchange packets without having to do any extra steps. It's just established, it's there, it works. Can you explain um, the incentive structure around Tor? Like, is there an incentive to run exit nodes or relays? Or no, like I mean, no, not, well, sort of there's an incentive, but it's not a good incentive. Uh, an, a, an incentive that exists with Tor to run an exit would be to collect data and to spy on people. That's the only incentive, really, other than altruism, which isn't really an incentive, I think, at least. Mm -hmm. But, like, the only kind of incentive that exists is a negative incentive. Do Tor or I2P make any effort to prevent Siebel attacks? Or can you explain how Tor does it? So, with Tor, what they do is they have their directory authority uh, relays that get to vote on what the routing consist consensus of the Tor network is. They get to uh, kick out bad relays that they think are bad. Um, and only the directory authority can do that at the moment. If someone wanted to start up an exit node, mm -hmm. um, what are some of the legal um, consequences that they might run into? Uh, DMCA notices. Lots of DMCA notices. And so a DMCA notice is a, uh, is, is, is a legal notice that says, hey you, you're infringing on my copyright, stop that please. And why would an exit node get a DMCA notice? Because someone is using your exit node to do BitTorrent or something. What are the biggest open issues at the MixNet space? You don't want to have to port your software to use uh, the MixNet. You don't want it. You don't want to have to care that your that your software is using it. You just want it to work. 
you want to press a button and oh hey, we have the mixnet on and it just, everything is working. So Tor has a really good packaging of Tor browser where you just open the browser, it works, it has this, this magical portal to the anonymous uh, internet access, right? Um, that is good for web browsing, but if you want to do anything else, it's a pain. Uh, because you have to like, uh, you, you have to either make your own version of Tor browser just for this protocol or go with, without it. Um, and, and that can be a, a, a really big pain. Um, but with, with something like LokiNet, what you get is a, effectively, a, a, well it is a VPN tunnel, it's just a, an anonymous VPN tunnel because it's going over multiple cascading hops to the exit that, ch that shift. With a VPN tunnel, you're just shoving everything over that tunnel at the end of the day. And, and that is a much cleaner, simpler way uh, to package things uh, for anonymous internet browsing. If you have it on, all your traffic goes over it. If it's off, it doesn't. If you really want adoption, you need to make it so that you don't care that you're using it. You don't want to notice that you're using it. You just want it to be there passively. And you want to also possibly make it the default setting on as many things as you can. What would you say to people who are worried about these mixnet protocols being used for negative things? I think that's kind of the wrong frame to go about when it comes to like these these technologies. It's not about how can you use it for bad because you will always find a way to use something for bad. Um, I, I think that the key thing here is um, figuring out uh, what good can you do with it? And not only what good can you do with it, but how, how can you make it such that the good overshadows the negative aspect of it? The tool should be separated from the user, right? Because the tool isn't doing bad, right? Necessarily. It, it's a, there are bad people out there and we need to protect ourselves from those bad people. And we can use all sorts of tools to do that. If you could create an imaginary mixnet with all of the properties that you wanted, what would be kind of the top three things that you would look for in that mixnet? Trust agility, uh, which means you can change uh, who you want to trust very fast without having like a hard coded list of you must trust these things, the, not things, but you must trust these parties involved. Um, I'd say the next one would be uh, civil resistance, which I don't think uh, you can fully mitigate, but you can definitely deter. Uh, and then I'd say you want to have it such that it's transparent. You don't care you using it. You don't need to port your application to use it. It just works. So do you think LARP or LokiNet moves towards those yeah. goals? Yeah, I think, I think it's, it's, it's definitely going to make a lot of things a lot simpler, a lot easier to, to use from the user point of view. And we're going to aim to make it faster than Tor. What's the difference in terms of routing between I2P and Tor? It really is layer 4 versus layer 3. I2P provides a pseudo layer 3, whereas Tor provides anonymous TCP extending of, of, of TCP streams. Uh, and that's layer 4. So at the end of the day, it really is about layer 3 versus layer 4. What technology specifically are you most excited about that you're trying to implement or that you think can, you can implement in the future in, in uh, looking at? It's probably the, the civil resistance. It's, it's, that's, that's the key. Because I don't think anyone has actually uh, gotten close uh, to solving that in an elegant way like uh, the Loki people have figured out. They showed me this really interesting kind of economic model that a lot that di that actually incentivizes uh, not honking but good behavior on the network.